This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Jambo, jambo, ni hao, ni hao. Hello, hello, everybody, and a very warm welcome to our safari drive. We are coming to you from the Masimar of Kenya, and we're coming to you live. My name is David, and this is World Wonderland. Absolutely magnificent. This is happening, folks. This is 100% live. Here we are. We're watching the migration story unfold. Here's a lion. There's a lion right next to us. Oh, that was close. You can't possibly script something like this. Good afternoon and welcome back to CGTN's Wild Wonderland live show. My name is James Hendry, as always. Enormous James is on the camera and we've got two magnificent cheetah over there lying in the shade. There's a lot of cloud coming over at the moment and we're possibly expecting a storm. We are coming to you from three locations live in Africa. Firstly, the Masai Mara here in Kenya, the Serengeti in Tanzania and way down south, the Western Kruger Park of South Africa. Our beautiful cheetah are having a snooze. They got something to eat yesterday. We're not sure what it was. And they are surrounded by the herds of the Great Migration. Please do talk to us for the duration of the show. You can do that on Twitter using the hashtag CGTNWild or the hashtag WildWonderland. Any questions or comments that you'd like to send us, we'd love to have from you. That's hashtag CGTNWild or hashtag WildWonderland on Twitter. Now, as always, the focus of our shows is these great thundering migrating herds of wildebeest, zebra and Thompson's gazelles. The red oat grass plains of the Mara Serengeti sway in anticipation. In February, Around 400,000 wildebeest are born on the short grass of the Serengeti's southern plains. Just half an hour, the calves have found their feet. And one of nature's greatest journeys begins. From the southern plains, more than a million animals move northwest into the Serengeti's western corridor, massing on the banks of the Grumeti River. As the rut ends, the herds gallop north once more. Eventually, two million grazers arrive to feast on the abundance of the Masai Mara. It begins with the trickle of the zebra vanguard, enjoying the undisturbed long grass plains, making the first crossings of the turbulent Mara River. Many fall to the rapids and the crocodiles. And then comes the main body of the migration, the thundering herds of white-bearded gnu leading songs of chaos in search of green pasture. The herds know the danger, but the call for food is too great. All must take the plunge. Not all will make it. For those that do, hungry prides and clans patrol the banks. For survivors, rich red oat grass is the reward. Before it's time to cross the river again, as nature's greatest herd follows the life-giving storms and verdant plains of the Mara Serengeti for nourishment. Good afternoon again and welcome to my vehicle in the Mara Triangle where we've been hit by the rain clouds James has, be, James has been alluding to. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Steve, joined by jean on camera. And, well, you can probably hear the pitter-patter of rain on our heads. We're thinking it's going to clear up. We've had to turn our vehicle slightly so as to avoid the rain. But uh, there was a whole pride of lions here. One has just come out of the long grass here again, jean which is good. We had six, seven of them. And as soon as the rain came down, they all scattered to get into the long grass and the shelter provided by the trees. Now you can see she's looking rather miserable, but I think also quite hungry. This is the River Pride, everybody, who we saw this morning. 
and we're going to see what they get up to. They're definitely hungry. They're looking at some warthogs running in the distance. So don't go anywhere. We will stay with this pride. And in the meantime, Jamie is down in South Africa in the Sabi Sands with my favorite, Young Leopard. A very special leopard and definitely one of our favorite characters. And just first and foremost, you can obviously see that there is a vehicle straight behind him. Unfortunately, I can't reposition at the moment. And of course, this is a reserve where tourists can come to view the animals. Oh, <laughs> a very good afternoon to you all. My name is Jamie and behind the camera is a Craig. And we are watching the Hos Hosanna male leopard as he it was actually a stalking a herd of elephants. Now this particular leopard has no ability to catch an elephant but because he is a young male and because he is playful he thought he'd go and have a look. And those elephants are slowly but surely moving towards a waterhole and he is hiding in the thickets and what you often see with elephants is that they will typically chase predators away if they spot them so Hassan has got to stay out of the way he knows that he can outrun them but he is not going to risk their wrath they're much bigger than him much stronger than him fortunately he's grown up here which means that he knows exactly how to handle these things now, across all the way in the Serengeti in Tanzania is Tristan and he also has some spotted cats of a different time. Indeed, we are with two cheetah brothers that are relaxing in the late afternoon heat at this stage of the game. They seem as though they're not going to be doing too much just yet, but there are some Thompson gazelles very, very close by, and so who knows, maybe we'll end up getting a bit of a hunt later. My name is Tristan on camera. I've got David, and it is a very warm welcome to the Tanzanian side of this afternoon show, and I hope that you guys are going to enjoy it as much as we are so far. It is an absolutely beautiful afternoon. Unlike where Steve is, we don't have too much rain hanging about at this stage, and there's beautiful sunshine, and these two cheetah brothers while they do have fairly big tummies, they do not have massive, massive tummies. And so the presence of things like Thompson's um, close by is always a good sign. And hopefully what's going to happen is as it starts to cool down now this afternoon, hopefully they're going to be able to spot those tummies and get up and they'll start them going towards them. Behind them is a big, big open plain. And most of those tummies are on the top end of that f sort of forested area in the background. And so hopefully they're going to get up and start walking in that direction a little bit later but for now it's just about staying nice and cool we've spent the better part of today with them and they've been really just lounging about in the shade so far but that's good news for us because while they've been resting most of the day it means that they've sort of stored some in energy um, to be able to use it this evening right we're going to carry on with these guys we're going to see what happens in the meantime though let's send you back across to trish down in south africa and see what's happened with her diker from this morning Welcome aboard everyone. I'm so glad to have you with us, especially since I think that this girl, the diker from the morning, is going to make it out. Around her it's gotten drier, so maybe she will just make it out. My name is Trishala with Seb on camera, and if you think that we went back to camp to have a nice time in the day, you'd be wrong because we spent a lot of time, in fact the entire day, sitting with this girl right here. And we've been watching. It's been very difficult for us. She's been trying really hard, but more than that, she's been a survivor. Through here came two elephant herds playing in the mud, Three bulls, Seb? Mm -hmm. Two bulls plus the must bull that we had earlier, plus a herd of impala, plus a hippo had come and drunk from there in the mud wallow completely. And she has just survived through it all. And I can't wait to watch her get out of this. And I really do think that she will. Now, if you're wondering exactly why we're not intervening at this point, it is because the policy of the area that we are in 
says that we cannot intervene if it is not a human-induced situation. And so far, by the conservation managers of the area, it has been decided that this is a natural situation that's unfolding in front of us. And most of all, we don't want to dwell on it and we don't want to distress anybody at all, myself and Seb included. So we're going to hang about so that we can watch her break free and get out of which I have plenty of faith that she will. She's actually looking much better. She was looking very weak earlier, but now that's dried up, it's giving her a bit of leverage to push herself up. And I really, really think that she will make it. Anyway, let me send you over to James with a cheetah and you'll only come back to me once we see something happening. It's a very distressing situation that playing out at Juma and very difficult for everyone concerned to watch. The cheetah are not concerned by those things however, they are only concerned with getting as much sleep as possible before they are either disturbed by their hunger or perhaps some scavengers or other predators coming along here. So far, on a hot day like today, they have not been disturbed. One of them's moved into the deeper shade and the other with his fat belly is still in the sun. Now, Vera, you ask an interesting question about a storm and whether it's good for their hunting. It really does depend on the extent of the storm. So if it's a huge thunderstorm with crashing lightning and crashing thunder and hail stones and rain teeming out the sky, then no, you'll find what they'll do is hide underneath a bush somewhere and take shelter. Light storms or wind absolutely helps them. There we go, heads up. Because it makes it very difficult for the prey to hear them coming and to smell them coming. But teeming, crashing rain, they will take shelter in much the same way that you and I will. Lions a little bit less so. They are more inclined to hunt in the rain, but I've also seen lions hiding under bushes in very nasty rain. So. Generally, most things behave very like we do, you know. They just don't like to be out in the extreme elements. They prefer to be under shelter. And so let's go up north into the Mara Triangle to find out how Steve's lions are coping with the storm there. Well, thanks, James. The rain seems to be slowing down now, and this lioness has done a couple little yawns as, as James says, lions are quite inclined to hunt in the wet weather. Um, hooved animals are actually at a disadvantage in the rain, especially when it's very muddy underfoot. Uh, the hooves are typical to, to sort of um, slide and slip in the wet, whereas the if you've ever walked in mud, you notice how you're able to splay your toes like this. Cats and dogs are able to splay their toes and actually get quite a bit of purchase in the mud. Whereas other animals slip and slide and their hooves, which are designed to help carry them along quite solid ground, it actually assists them in walking long distance, uh, like wearing a good pair of shoes versus barefoot, it assists in walking very far. Um, but the hooves aren't an advantage in the wet. And down here along the river, this whole alluvial area, there's huge amounts of clay and sediment washed down by the river and deposited and this clay makes it very, very tricky for animals to manoeuvre in the wet. Uh, and that's why this area is an exclusively non-off-roading area. We would get very, very stuck, even with our very powerful car. But we're going to see what these lions get up to as the rain starts to abate. But Tristan is caught up with his two cheetah. Let's go and see if they're going to take advantage of the afternoon. The one nice thing about being in East Africa is generally the storms 
do pass quite quickly and it'll be interesting to see what those lions get up to after the rain does stop as you can see we're still sitting with our beautiful boys both of them are very very relaxed at the moment and what it looks like is that they might have had a meal at some point in the last probably day i don't think it was this morning maybe yesterday their tummies do have a little bit of a bulge in them but it's nothing major at this stage so they still definitely could hunt and right behind me and up on top of the hill is the prey that these guys often go looking for so you'll see up the top there that is where the tommy's will, or thompson gazelle uh, are sitting and that is one of the cheetah's absolute favorite animals to go after the problem is is that they're very very fast and very difficult to cut down and in an open section like this it's not easy for cheetah because they need to find a place where they can at least get a little bit of cover in order to approach them so you can see they're probably about 150 meters from them and at this stage not too perturbed by the presence of those tommies as yet kimberly are ter cheetahs territorial so yes they are territorial and um, what you'll find is that you'll have females that have their own territory in which that they'll raise cubs and then you'll get males that often form coalitions now sometimes you will find males on their own but for the most part they do form coalitions and these two that are together now could either be siblings or they could have been two young cheetahs that might have found each other and formed a coalition generally it's um siblings that form coalitions together and their chance of survival is much more if they stay together because they're able to expand their territories out include more females in it and obviously be a lot more successful when it even comes to hunting two cheetah chasing a thompson gazelle is much easier than just one on its own but you can see our boy is having a little bit of a nap we've spent a couple of days with these guys and most of the time they seem to enjoy sleep during the day and they start to stir a little bit later in the afternoon but absolutely beautiful animal is a cheetah good well we're going to carry on sitting with them we'll hope that they start to get up and move in the meantime though let's send you all the way to Masai Mara and see what David's sausage tree pride is getting up to Apparently Tristan is not very far from where I am and him having uh, full bellied cheetahs. I also got fully bellied lion, lions that you cannot see very well at the moment because they are in the grass. You saw earlier Steve with different lions and where he was it was raining and this tells you how diverse or how vast the Masai Mara game reserve is. It's so huge that I do not have even a drop of rain where I am. If you look carefully there, there's a lioness laying flat in the grass there. And remember, we are coming to you live from the Masai Mara. And should you have any comments or questions, you may send through. And you may use CGTN Live or Wild Wonderland Twitters. This particular pride of lions here is called the Sausage Tree Pride because they have been known to love climbing trees. And one of them that got four cubs have a very interesting story with her cubs. Sadly, we are rather used to the tragic loss of lion cubs. Only one or two in ten survived adulthood. So, as Meaty watched her little ones one afternoon, it was with some surprise and anticipation that we noticed a mewling distress call from the river below. Meaty was intrigued by the call, but made no move to go and investigate. That night, however, our anticipation turned to delight, as a brave cub scrambled out of the ditch, thin and with very weak hind legs. As soon as the famished wretch had joined her family, she latched on and drank with obvious relief. The brave cub may have somehow survived for five days without food. She continues to be a little wobbly on her back legs and is wary of her siblings' rough games. Meaty's fourth cub remains smaller but strengthens with each meal. It's always difficult for us to watch cubs being born. It's a mixed kind of emotional state because you feel sad 
because you know they are so vulnerable, but at the same time you feel elated because it's just such an amazing thing to see baby animals, especially baby lions. Anyway, it's a great relief there that Meaty found her youngsters. Now we're having a look at the herds here. We started on a white-backed vulture, which is hoping one of these many thousands of wildebeest in front of us is going to drop dead so that it can have a meal. At the moment that doesn't look like happening. And you can just see the astounding abundance of these wildebeest herds. For me, I haven't seen nearly as many zebra as I did last year, but the wildebeest have been quite astonishing, as always. And you can just hear that superb noise. It's just such a celebration. It's like the holiday season now in the Masai Mara. It's almost as if the entire place has been waiting for these few months when this carnival of activity takes place up in one of possibly the most glorious wilderness areas on our entire planet. That is the Mara Serengeti. Now there are no herds up north in the Mara Triangle just yet. We're hoping that by the end of the week they will be there. Steve is there however, so is the rain and so is an endangered turkey-like bird. Indeed, you are correct, James. The lions are waiting up here in anticipation for the herds to arrive. They will at some stage, and you are with us once again on the CGTN Wild Wonderland live show, where we have found three southern ground hornbills moving through the grass here. And if anything likes the rain, these guys thoroughly enjoy the rain. Uh, it pushes termites and insects to the surface and they walk around and they pick up all sorts of things, including snakes, uh, all sorts of reptiles, lizards, frogs. They'll even take small rodents and even baby birds from their nests on the ground. Radley, you want to know the rain season in the Mara? Well, it is quite unpredictable, but there are two peaks around April and around October, November are the two peaks of the rainy season. So they call them bimodal, but throughout the year, there is potential for rain. Uh, with the escarpment, the mountain that we have here, we are in a very tropical environment and we do get rain all over the, t all over the place. But the two major peaks being sort of April, May, and October, November time. And it is the rains that provide the nutrient rich soils here with the ability to grow all the juicy, beautiful grasses that the wildebeest herds come all the way from the south for. Enormous amounts of lava was erupted onto the earth's surface in the Mara and in the Serengeti system. And that produces enormous potential for grass biomass. And it doesn't only provide the food for all of the wildebeest, but all the predators as well as birds like these ground hornbill. But the cheetah themselves also try and make advantage or take advantage of the herds. I think Tristan's cheetah have finally woken up. They have indeed. Well, the one has woken up and I'm not sure how much longer he's going to be walking around. This particular male has actually got a slight limp on him and you'll notice that his tummy is not nearly as full as the other male. And I think what's happened is when the hunt took place, this male maybe was left behind a little bit and he didn't quite get as much. And so I think he's the one that is still hungry and it's maybe why he's up because he walked to his brother kind of head rubbed a little bit almost as if to say come on we need to get up and go i've got things to go and do and you can see now both of them are up which is absolutely fantastic now i'm hoping that they're going to head in the direction that they're kind of facing at the moment and you might see this one will go to the loo and that's going to be part of those territorial markings that we were talking about earlier often what cheetah do when they are marking territories they'll actually go to a high point like a rock or a termite mound and they'll defecate on top there both urine and feces and that will then send a clear signal to any other cheetah that comes along that this is their territory and their area. And they do this pretty regularly throughout their territory. Um, and what you can see now is the other male is going and sniffing where the male was lying down. Now we might see a little Fleming grimace. 
So there you go. You see how it's opening its mouth and showing its teeth? Now that's called a Fleming grimace. A Fleming grimace is essentially a way that a cheetah analyzes the chemical scent that is left behind by another. So they have an organ of Jacobson in the roof of their mouth with two little pits. And so as they smell, they curl their lips back and that scent then goes in and it's able to then be analyzed by their brain and tell them, is it male? Is it female? Is it a cheetah that they know? Or any of that information, which is absolutely amazing. And you see a lot of different animals doing it. Lions are often seen doing it as well as leopard and various other things. Even rhinos will see them doing it too. But they definitely look a lot more awake, don't they? And I'm hoping that we're going to see them starting to get to move. But isn't that tail absolutely beautiful? When you watch them walk and you see that tail flicking back and forth, it is one of the most magnificent tails that we have in nature, is the big cheetah tail. And you can see how it's almost flattened on the end, which is vitally important for this animal when it is in a hunting mode. It almost acts like a little bit of a rudder. So that's how they'll be able to um, basically change direction very, very quickly and be able to hunt down the prey that they need. Oh, this one's just busy sniffing. I wouldn't be surprised that it urinates on the tree. So old birds, are cheetah a threatened species? Yes, they are a threatened species. Unfortunately, what's happened with cheetahs, their numbers have declined drastically to a point where their genetic code and their genetic viability is actually not very good at all. And they, they are at a point where there's been a lot of inbreeding, which has led to a bit of disease. And so it's not the greatest um, genetic code that they've got. And so their numbers are not very, very big throughout Africa. In fact, what you're finding now is that they're trying to do a project where they're trying to actually move cheetah around Africa, um, so from South Africa up into Kenya, into Tanzania, to try and actually start getting the genetic diversity to, to widen a little bit and to try and build a much stronger gene pool out of the cheetah. Now you see they're up and moving. Unfortunately, they are moving away from where the Thompson gazelles are. That one's just sat down over there. So we're going to try and just reposition quickly and just see there's a bit of water there, so they might have a little bit of a drink. But while we do that, we're going to send you across to Steve, who's got the absolute king of the predators in this area well thanks Tristan indeed cheetah are fantastic animals to spend time with uh, we are in the open area here still around Kitra the airstrip landing strip is towards the back there this beautiful open area and we are with a big male lion part of the Kitra coalition and his name is half tail because if he got up ooh, he's gonna yawn normally lions get up after yawning He's got the tip of his tail is missing. Now, how that happened is very hard for me to tell you. It could have been bitten off or it could have been something else that might have done it. But uh, we all think lions are these supreme predators. But we look around on this open plain and they are animals all over the place. They are not at all bothered by the presence of the lions. Because when they can see the predator, then they are quite okay. They are buffalo, they are Thompson's gazelle, they're in parlor. There are all sorts, topies as well, all over the place. There's a topi, middle on the right, there's an impala, front left, and then all the others are Thompson's gazelle. And there's another topi on his way actually towards this lion lion, but they know if they can see them, they're much quicker. But male lions need to form coalitions to defend territories against other male lions. Let's go and have a little look more at that. For male lions, the comforts of the pride do not last for long. At adolescence, the dominant males will force them out. The dejected youth then looks to form his own coalition. For a single male, a test of strength is how he earns his spot. While brothers ousted from the same pride can make their own coalition, their battles are for mating rights. But this endless cycle of conflict and resolution has purpose. It is natural selection 
in its purest form. Often coalition members spend extended periods alone. Coalition territories are vast and require a huge effort to patrol and protect. Each regal cat must stay vigilant to ensure his legacy. Look at this, look at this. We've gone from one of the most powerful forces out here in the African wilderness to something so precious and so vulnerable. You are watching CGTN's Wild Wonderland and we have a seven month old leopard cub who is plucking away at the fur of something that mom has caught for her. This little girl has come so far in life. She is the daughter of a leopardess called Shudulu, which means termite mound. And she hasn't yet received her official name, but that doesn't make her any less of a fierce little predator as she tucks into her Steenbock kill. Now, I apologize, that was the reason for my discombobulation earlier. I had just, just learned that she had been found. As you can imagine, this is a very, very special moment for all of us. This is actually the first time that I've seen this cub. Shadulu so rarely brings her across to this area. There she goes. Does that fur not taste very nice? Look at that face. Is that not just too precious for words? If you'd like to share your emotions that this evokes within you, send us through one word, a one word description of what the sighting makes you feel. Now, I said that she is seven months old. She is already equipped with the weaponry that will make her a force to be reckoned with in months to come. So she has got those claws and those fierce teeth and in fact was eating meat at around about between six weeks to two months old. Her mother is actually lying just over there, over my head, that should do Lou over there. She's worked hard to keep her cub safe and life out here can be so, so tough. She's already wa lost one member of this litter, this little one's sibling, just a few months ago. And that is very typical out here. Life is tough for leopards and their cubs. Carla's one word tweet is sweet. I agree completely, Carla. I just really wanted to share this moment with you. It might be fleeting. We can't spend too long with this little chap or this little girl, but it's definitely something that we are enjoying. And we're deeply grateful that a friend of mine actually called me to tell me that she was here. Awesome. Absolutely awesome. So there you go. It's not often that I'll leave Hosanna, but in this case, I had to make the exception. Tristan doesn't have any difficult choices to make, though. He is with the cheetah of the Serengeti. Indeed, Jamie, and I must be honest, I'm a little bit jealous of Jamie because I spend a large portion of my time looking for leopards when I'm in South Africa. And the fact that she's had two this afternoon on foot and Shadulu's cub, which I have yet to see, is a very, very, very kind of exciting in one respect and like I say it makes me a little bit jealous in another but very very cool and I'm so glad that all of you got to see it now for those of you who've just joined us my name is Tristan and it is a very very big welcome to Serengeti National Park in Tanzania it is one of the most beautiful parks in Africa and we are sitting with two cheetah brothers that are well getting up and starting to get awake it's just at the time of the day where the sun is getting low it's cooled down a lot and you can see they're quite alert we've already had them get up and urinate and and scent mark and then they started to go on a little bit of a trot they found this termite mound and they just lay down briefly but you can see with that head up and those ears focused that they are very much awake and hopefully this is a good sign for us in terms of the fact that they might start to look to hunt this time of the day is often a time when cheetah do hunt because you'll find that especially in an environment like the Serengeti which has got a lot of woodland areas on the edges of these plains is that a lot of the antelope species they start to move out of these woodlands into 
the open plains. And so it's the perfect time for cheetah to be able to strike and to be able to start hunting. So it's important that we spend a lot of time with them and we see whether or not they are going to hunt this afternoon. There's quite a few different animals around at the moment. We've seen a few wildebeest, we've got a few Tommy um, or Thompson's gazelles. Um, we even saw an Oruby a little bit earlier. And so there's enough animals for them to hunt. It's just deciding on which one they would like to go for. Now they seem in this area to favor going after Oruby because they typically are on their own. We watched a cheetah a few days ago actually hunt an Oruby and it's much easier when there's only one set of eyes than it is to hunt something like a herd of Thompson gazelles where there's lots of them. So we'll just see where they go and what they're going to get up to. In the meantime though, let's send you up to James who's in the midst of the massive great migration. We are now in amongst another giant herd. I thought for a little while that we had a big herd before, but it was nothing like the extent of the animals that we have over here. I think we're probably looking at about, almost impossible to guess, 10,000 or so wildebeest and zebra. My name is James Henry. Enormous James is on camera as always with his gloved hand. And you are watching CGTN's Wild Wonderland live show. Let's have a look at these magnificent animals here. Now, you may have noticed that the light is starting to fade slightly. The sun is making its way down over the western horizon, and that means that the time of the predators is shortly to come. And I know that the pride of lions we saw this morning is still under the very same tree, and it's not far from here. And the sound and smell of these gnuing gnus is almost certainly going to draw them out as the sun goes down, as twilight falls, and they're going to get in amongst these herds and try and catch themselves another meal. Now, I always feel quite sad when I think about that because I think of the struggles that these animals have got through to get up here. They've crossed the river, they've run a long way, and it's just sad for me to think that they won't all make their way back to the Serengeti at the end of the migration season, but that's just the way of nature really, and for the lions, it's a happy, wonderful time. This It's like their carnival as well, because life is much easier during the migration than it is when these herds are way down south. Isn't the sound just astonishing? Just amazing. Righty, now I am also jealous of Jamie because I haven't seen Shadulu's cub just yet, but unlike me, uh, you can go and see her. I'm sorry, James. I promise you'll get to see her at some point. Although, I must say, this is the first time that I've seen her and she is seven months old. Look at those gorgeous eyes. I wonder perhaps if Shudulu wishes that she had the abundance of the migration. She, of course, has no idea what she's missing out on, but I'm sure that it would make feeding this little monster a lot easier. Now, at this age, all leopard cubs have voracious appetites. They go through something of a growth spurt from around about between six months to a year old, where all of a sudden they get these gangly long limbs and they just seem to be a veritable bottomless pit when it comes to food. And of course, leopard mothers have to do it all on their own. They have to go out, they have to find food, and every time they do that, they have to leave their precious, vulnerable little cubs somewhere safe and take them back to the kill. Now, I might have misheard that, but Robin, I think your one word tweet was groan. Um, and I assume that's in reference to the fact that the last time we saw this little one... Uh, yes, uh, the last time we saw this little one, she was just a little tiny bundle of fluff, where now she's actually starting to take shape and look a little bit more like the adult leopards that we see. But at this stage, she still retains some of that uh, cub-like fluffiness. When they're born, they're almost black in color because their spots are so close together, and they are very, very fluffy. 
and she has retained that and will for quite a considerable period of time. Now, that's actually the same whether we're talking about uh, cheetahs or leopard cubs, both of which are very fluffy, and for the mothers of both, they face challenging times. The ultimate triple threat versus an iconic specialist. One built for stealth, power and ambush. The other designed for speed. The cheetah is decorated with black spots. The leopard with copper rosettes. The leopard, a stalking cat of the woodlands. The cheetah, a coursing cat of the plains. While leopards are strong and agile enough to hoist their kills away from thieving lions and hyenas, cheetahs are built exclusively for speed. They lack the strength to stash their kills or fight off scavengers. And while leopards live alone, Cheetah often find comfort in the company and protection of siblings. Each cat is the master of their domain and holds a special place atop the African food chain. As you can see, it really is a very different animal. Leopard and cheetah often get confused, and obviously both animals have spots, but their looks and their entire behavior is completely different. And it's why we find them in different areas. If you were to go down to Juma, cheetah is quite a rare sighting. You don't see them very often at all because of the very dense, thick nature of that environment. Whereas here, the big open plains are perfectly suited to the speed of a cheetah. And so this is why we see a lot more cheetah, both in the Masai Mara and the Serengeti. It's not to say there isn't leopard in here and there isn't cheetah in South Africa, but it's just those environments dictate the percentages of those animals. And it's mostly to do with the fact that it's much easier for each one to survive in those respective habitats. But you can see our two cheetah brothers are still just kind of sitting and watching. This is typical cheetah behavior where they lie down with their head kinked up like that and they'll scan around. And what you'll see is each one will look almost in different directions until they spot what they're looking for. And then you'll find the body language will change somewhat. They'll get quite alert. And if they're going to hunt, then they're going to get up and start moving and the other one will follow. What's already immediately noticeable about this pair is that the one closest to us seems to be the more dominant of the two. The one at the back follows the one in front. And when the one in front moves, the back one moves. But when the back one moves, the one in front really doesn't actually pay too much attention at all. So it's interesting to see, even though there's only two of them, there's still a little hierarchy that is formed between these two brothers. And they'll kind of dictate how they go. And I'd be very interested to see if they came across a female who would actually mate and what their sort of interactions would be. I suspect that the one in front would be the one that would end up mating long before the one at the back. But what a special way to spend a day to sit here and in the accompaniment of the world's fastest land animal is just absolutely amazing. I thoroughly enjoy spending time with spotted cats in general. Um, obviously leopards are my favorite but cheetah are wonderful as well. Right, we will stay with them for the remainder of the afternoon. Hopefully they are going to get up again and start moving. In the meantime though, let's send you back across to David and the magnificent Sausage Tree Pride. Well, hopefully uh, Tristan, your cheetahs are going to rise up and shine.
But I also decided to leave my lions, the sausage trip, right, because we were flat, flat like pancakes. And then, Dorsh, as you just said, I look for some pacadams, and you got small a cheetah of the five predators, cheetah being the smallest. We have the largest of the land mammals here in Africa. Well, ladies and gentlemen, should you be joining us now? My name is David, and we are coming to you live from the Masimara CGTN World Wonderland Show, and we are live from the Masimara. And should you have any questions or comments, please don't be shy. Send them through hashtag CGTN World or hashtag Wild Wonderland. Now, leaving my cats behind is because they're very flat, as I just said, but there are some animals here in Africa that will never make you tired. And apparently, elephants are my favorite animals. Just look at them, always busy and always doing something. And that's how I can justify elephants being my favorite animals. And they're always doing something, either eating or drinking, flicking their ears, throwing their trunks up. And if you look at them carefully, they're not eating the red oat grass. They're choosing the short grass that is much greener and definitely more nutritious well i'll try and go closer to these elephants a little bit but my friend on the other side of the mara got lions who are on a kill right we've come to the lion pride this is the salt lick pride three sort of probably seven month old cubs and three little 12 week, eight to 12 week old cubs. There they are. Now, there's a lot of debate in the world about what the cutest animal in nature is. Some people say leopard cubs. Some people say baby elephants. For me, it is little baby lion cubs at around about six weeks old. Look at it. They're just too cute. This one is now losing its cuteness and it is a voracious meat eater at about mm, yeah, seven months old or so and what they're eating is a wildebeest that they killed last night and although they are unquestionably full the pride will quite possibly go hunting again this evening especially as we're not far from some big herds I also think there's something quite incongruous about this picture because if we zoom in what you'll notice in front of them are two kinds of flowers. There's some yellow flowers and then there's some beautiful purple flowers as well. And it's just quite incongruous to see this dead carcass, all the blood, and then the beauty of nature as well. And I just think that's quite nice to think about. Right, these are my favorite, my cutest kind of animals, the tiny baby lions. Many of you might disagree and you can go and tell Jamie about that. I do have an alternative uh, cub for you, and I have an alternative answer. The cutest cub is the one that you're sitting with at the time, because otherwise it's almost impossible to choose. We've got a similar sort of contrast to that of James. We don't have flowers, but we do have the carcass and this cuteness, and the two of them together provide uh, such a beautiful art. Oh, look at that. Such a beautiful insight into the beauty and the, the difficult aspect of nature. She needs to eat, which meant that the Stirnbok needed to die, unfortunately. She's using her carnassial teeth, her molars, to crunch down over the ear, which she has pretty much completely removed. Now, as you can imagine, there are people who would like to see this little leopard cub, so we're going to have to say goodbye to it shortly, which is very sad, because I really, really just don't want to go anywhere. Quick reintroduction, in case you have forgotten. My name is Jamie, and behind the camera is Craig. We're going to give you one last look at Shadulu's gorgeous little bunny. And as we do that, we're going to send you back across to Steve in the Masai Mara with his lions. I am so jealous. I've yet to see Shadulu's cub. 
We saw her in the early stages when she was looking for a den, but I've never seen her. How lucky you are indeed. Well, we've moved back from our male lion, and the pride that we were with earlier has moved out into the sunshine to try and uh, warm themselves or dry themselves from the torrential downpour we had. And my name, once again, is Steve Falkenridge, joined again by jean on camera, and we are with the River Pride. Um, the Mara River is just there behind them, and this is the area they call their territory. Now, with the Kitra males being quite close by, and they are the territorial holders of a much larger area, encompassing more than one pride. So the coalitions are there for protecting the females and for protecting very large territories that have prides inside of them. And then they look after the cubs, their lineage, and there are two, seemingly two adults here. There's one touching her face. She's a, a young female. And then the one on the left, you can see the back of the head is a young boy. He's just put his head down. And this looks like another female in the front. One has just sat up. It looks like another young male. You can see by the fur <laughs> around the neck. And he's a little bit damp. And shaking the mud off of the, or the water off of the body. The lions don't have the, the cover that we have. So when the downpour came, it was quite quick. But the sunshine is now out once again to make the grass once again nice and crisp. Something that the elephants love to munch on. In, in general, most cats do not like getting wet, and lions are no exception. But there's some animals, whether it rains, cats and dogs, they don't care very much, and I'm talking about the elephants. Like this particular one huge bull that we're watching here, even with the rains, they'll still keep doing what they're doing. Interesting, where Steve is, he got some rains, and where I am, it's very dry, and it's very shiny. Wonderful temperatures we got, very nice light in this red oat grass that you're seeing with all scattered trees. And these trees are very iconic trees of the Mara that we call the shepherd trees or the torchwood trees. A nice set of elephants here. I'm looking at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. That's the average size of a herd of elephants. And you're talking about dominance earlier with Tristan. And elephants, we all know, are very matriarchal. There will always be one female that will always lead the herd in where to go, where to eat, when, and making very vital decisions. Now, as much as Ali was saying they'll be eating the only green, nutritious grass once in a while, you'll see them uh, getting a bit of the red oat grass, which it doesn't have much nutrition value, I would guess. Most of it is just under, but you notice they are putting the green one, which has maybe more vitamins and more nutrients. Well, we'll try again, move a little closer, like I just did before. Let's go to the hungry lions on the other part of the Mara with James. Now, I think that adult lions lose their cuteness. Oh, there's a big fight with some vultures going on up in the tree above these guys. I think big lions lose their cuteness. They lose cuteness and become magnificent at around about two and a half years of old age, I think. The cubs are up and they're playing. If we go across to them. And they're looking up into the tree where the vultures are having a little bit of a fight. I think they'll probably spend the night up there, the vultures, hoping that the lions will leave and go off hunting. I mean, look at that little face. It's too cute for words. Don't you think? It's looking up at the vultures. Can't believe what it's seeing. Now, the only way to truly understand whether or not the lions are cuter than the leopards or vice versa is to see them both at the same time. In all of nature, there is little more adorable than a big cat cub. The contradiction between voracious predator and helpless fluffball makes these moments all the more special. Watching cubs grow is a delight second to none. 
many of the skills cubs will need in later life, they develop playing with their siblings. Stalking. Pouncing. Chasing. And wrestling. Testing different cuisine is part of growing up, even if it is a grubby business. For lions, teamwork is essential. For the solitary leopard, it's stealth and instinct. For the cheetah, painstaking lessons teach their young the complicated skills required for chasing, killing and eating. The road from cub to big cat in the African wild is both risky and rewarding. Well, cubs really are the most incredible things and to be able to follow them as they grow and become adults is just one of the most special moments that you can have in a career as a, as a guide. And we've been very fortunate, many of the guides at Wild Wonderland, to have followed many of our leopard cubs down in South Africa grow to adulthood. Um, Hosanna being one of them that you met earlier with Jamie on foot. And we watched him from only about 12 hours old all the way to where he is now. And so it's a very special thing to be able to do that. Our two cheetah boys are still sitting. It's a beautiful, beautiful late afternoon light at the moment. I was hoping that they were going to get up and move, but I think they're just enjoying basking in the sun and enjoying the view. Now, Linda, how many cubs can a cheetah have? Generally, one to four is the average with, with cheetah. Um, but there has been a recorded case, and I stand to be correct, on this, but I th think, if I remember correctly, it was seven cubs that were born to a, a female at one time, which is a huge number of cubs. Very, very difficult for her to raise all of those. Um, cheetah have a lot of issues when it comes to raising cubs. In fact, in the Maasai Mara, in the area where David and James and Steve is, there hasn't been a cheetah cub raised in the last two to three years, which gives you an idea of just how difficult it is for cheetahs to raise cubs between hyenas and lions. Um, and leopard, it's very, very, very tricky for them and they really do have to struggle and have to be very, very kind of active in the way that they raise their cubs. They've got to move them around quite a bit and they've got to make sure that they keep them in safe areas. Now, talking about baby animals, it sounds like David has left his Sausage Street Pride and he's managed to find one of the cutest baby animals we get in the open plains of Africa. Well, baby animals out here in the African wilderness, Tristan, you're right, will always interest you. Whatever babies they are, whatever animal, be it from hyenas, from rhinos, from lions, any baby animal here in Africa, it's very special. And you've got a young, tiny, I would say, baby elephant there. And by now, she has definitely learned how to eat. And you can see those keep flicking their tails either because of getting irritated by flies. And if Bunge, you take me a little bit to the right, there's one like a mother and a young calf on a tamarind mound. Sheng Yu, that's a very good question. And I'm sure you know one of the habitats, Sheng Yu, you're asking how did I find the elephants? One of the habitats of the Mara is the savannah. From where I am, I can tell you, I can comfortably see two, three kilometers straight because in the Mara, we don't have what we call visual pollution. So from where I was watching the lions earlier, I spotted uh, these elephants and I thought, well, I don't need <clears throat> to spend a lot of time, excuse me, with the flat uh, cuts. Why don't I move to my favorite animals, which are the elephants? And I think that is a cow and her young baby. And if you look at her carefully, she doesn't have any tusks. How hungry both of them are, a mother and a young one. Well, my elephants are pretty active, unlike my lions that I had before. But I think James' lions are more active than mine.
I know David was describing how he finds animals. Frankly, I think sometimes it's wizardry because he does do a remarkable job of finding animals in places that nobody else seems to be able to, especially those sausages. Our lions are waking up, as happens as the cool starts to come. There's a cool breeze blowing in from the storm that hit Steve a little bit earlier, and so the lions are starting to wake up. And it always happens like this. They sit up a bit, they have a bit of a groom, and then they lie down again and go to sleep. Then they get up again and do a bit of grooming, and then they lie down again. And eventually, they'll start to move off, probably on the hunt, the adults. They might sleep until 8 o'clock or so this evening, but I suspect quite strongly that at some stage this evening they will go. He will not. He will most likely stay there and just feed until the wee hours of the morning, most likely. Quite unlikely that he will take part in any hunt until he's at least sort of one and a half years old, probably. Um, Minamu, I'm afraid I missed that question on account of the fact that there's a vehicle about to land in my lap. Oh, right, right. Minamu, you want to know at what age cubs will be fully grown? Cubs will be fully grown at around about... Well, a big male lion, only when he's about six and a half to eight years old, will he gain full mass. A female, probably around about four years old. I'm sorry about the noise. This is obviously full of tourists who are really loving all of the animals that we have here during the migration in the Masai Mara. Okay, that is the end of this afternoon's safari. We will, of course, see you tomorrow again from the Serengeti in Tanzania, from South Africa, the Kruger Park, and here in the Masai Mara of Kenya, where the Great Migration continues. Thank you very much for joining us on CGTN's Wild Wonderland live show. It's been an absolute privilege.